three needs related of the best joinery. In addition of lending mechanical strength and gluing area to a connection, joinery must also allow for the movement of wood, its swelling and shrinkage as it absorbs and releases moisture. The best joinery relates all three needs. 1. Wood Movement Scientists describe wood as a hygroscopic material, that is, it absorbs moisture. Long after a tree has been felled and its wood milled, and made into furniture, the fibrous cells absorb and release moisture, mirroring the humidity of the surrounding air. The consequences for the woodworker are serious, wood swells as it absorbs moisture and shrinks as it expels, causing motion that accounts for most failed joints, wobbly chairs, sticking doors, and split picture frames. Although wood movement is unavoidable, such consequences are not. An understanding of wood's characteristics will enable you to accommodate this swelling and contraction and produce joinery that is both durable and stable. The wood of most species is characterized by growth rings, which are concentric bands perpendicular to the axis of the trunk. The manner in which the rings are exposed on a wood surface can help you anticipate how the piece will react to humidity changes. As the illustration below shows, there is more swelling and shrinkage along the growth rings than across them. The way lumber is cut from a log has a crucial effect on how much the wood will shrink and which dimension, length, width, or thickness, will be most affected. Any piece of wood provides three views of annual growth rings. The transverse section, or cross section, lies at right angles to the grain and is visible in the end grain of stock. The tangential and radial sections are at right angles to the transverse section. Being able to distinguish the different views of the rings on a workpiece can help you compensate for wood movement in your joinery. Lumber does not shrink uniformly. Tangential shrinkage, parallel to the annual growth rings, is almost twice the radial shrinkage, which occurs across the rings. This difference accounts for the warping of boards and panels as with contracts and expands with fluctuations in moisture content. Radially cut boards, also known as quarter sawn, are more dimensionally stable than tangentially cut, or plain sawn boards because they shrink and swell less across their width. Plain sawn boards tend to cup at the edges. Greater tangential than radial shrinkage can cause square boards to become diamond-shaped and cylindrical ones to become oval. Logs are sawn in two basic ways, with many variations. The most common system, called plain sawing, slices the log tangent to the growth rings. Their method, less commonly used, is called quarter sawing or edge grain sawing. It takes slices at right angles to the growth rings. Although the techniques used in the annual growth rings in the plain sawn oak board appear on the face as an elliptical landscape figure, plain sawn stock is sliced tangent to the rings. The growth rings in the quarter sawn oak board appear as lines perpendicular to the face. Each system are very different, each will produce some boards with characteristics of the other. For example, plain sawing through the center of a log produces a piece of stock that looks much like a quarter sawn board. Quarter sawn boards have their annual growth rings perpendicular to the face. This orientation of the growth rings accounts for the superior dimensional stability of quarter sawn boards. Wood shrinks and expands roughly twice as much tangentially to the rings as it does radially. When quarter sawn boards swell or shrink they do so mostly in thickness, which is minimal whereas a plain sawn board changes across its width. A table made from plain sawn pine board, for example, can change as much as one inch in width. A similar table made from quarter sawn boards would only swell or shrink by one quarter as much or less, depending on the species. Although you may not be able to control the environment where your furniture will be used, you can make your joinery choices to compensate for wood movement. Orient the growth rings in the mating pieces of a joint so that they move together. For example, the rings of the two parts of a corner joint should be parallel to each other so that they shrink or swell in tandem. When the rings of the pieces meet at right angles, as in a mortise and tenon joint, make sure their tangential surfaces are aligned. Work pieces that feature irregular grain require particular attention. 
a square chair leg with growth rings that run diagonally through it when viewed in cross-section, for example, will eventually lose its square shape and become a diamond shape, pulling the chair frame out of square with it. A drawer glued up from plain sawn boards illustrates how grain alignment can make or break a joint. By aligning the boards so that the annual growth rings curve inward, the joint may separate at the top and bottom when the front cups as it dries. If the boards are aligned so that the annual rings curve outward, drying of the wood will tend push the top and bottom toward the mating piece, keeping the joint together. 2. Form and Function Selecting the joinery for a project involves both structural and aesthetic considerations. The curved through dovetail blends strength and attractive for drawers that will be the highlight of a piece. The utilitarian dado joint is a good choice to anchor the shelving in a modern cabinet. Ideally, joinery should achieve a balance between form and function. Each joint must complement the overall design of a piece, while resisting the stresses to which it will be subjected. The choice of a joint will often be dictated by its function and location. Carcase corners can be joined with a host of joinery methods. But a carcase that is more likely to be visible, such as a drawer, will benefit from a visually pleasing joint like a half-blind dovetail or box joint. For other project components, the options are more limited. A frame and panel door, for example, may call for either blind or haunched mortise and tenons while a chair with round rungs should ideally be assembled with round mortise and tenons, the wood you choose will also have a bearing on your options. The chart lists the various joints shown in this video and rates their utility with solid wood, plywood, and partable board. A joint like the frame butt, can be used with any material, but only if the connection is reinforced. As a rule of thumb, any joint involving end grain must be reinforced in some way. The dovetail, while it requires no reinforcement, is only appropriate with solid wood. Once you have chosen your joinery, prepare your stock. Carefully joint and smooth all mating surfaces. If you are unsure about which joint to select for a given application, choose the simplest one, particularly if it will be hidden. 3. Bonding Wood 
over tightening the clamps on a glue joint can squeeze out all the adhesive, resulting in a starved joint. Apply a thin, even layer of glue on the mating surfaces and stop tightening when a small bead of adhesive squeezes out of the joint. Proper bonding of mating surfaces can be achieved in three steps. Number 1. Preparing the surface meticulously. The mating surfaces of a joint must be made as flat and smooth as possible with a jointer or hand plane. Rough surfaces have hundreds of tiny air pockets that can cause uneven gluing. Surfaces should also be clean. Oil, sawdust, grease, and dirt can weaken a glue bond. Some oily woods, such as teak and rosewood, have extractives that inhibit the gluing process, but before glue up removes most of the residue from the surfaces. Number 2. Applying the right type and amount of adhesive. While glues made from organic materials such as fish glue and hide glue have been in use for centuries, most modern adhesives are derived from synthetic compounds. Glues such as resorcinol and epoxy cure by chemical reaction, while yellow and white glue cure by evaporation of the solvent they contain. Most glues seep into the wood, locking the wood fibers together and creating a bond that is stronger than the wood itself. To select the proper adhesive for your joinery tasks, see the chart. When applying glue, spread it evenly over both mating surfaces of the joint. It is better to apply a thin coat to both surfaces than a heavy coat to one. Too much glue is better than not enough. Avoid spreading glue with your fingers. A set of stiff bristled brushes of different sizes can handle most gluing tasks. Some other applicators are shown here. Number 3. Proper Clamping Joints should be clamped immediately after the adhesive is applied. Position your clamps carefully to avoid cupping or bowing of the work pieces. Clamping presses the glue into a uniform thin film between the mating surfaces, while holding the pieces until curing takes place. Removing excess glue, scraping away adhesive. Once all your clamps have been tightened, use a putty knife to remove as much of the squeezed out glue as possible, after it sets but before it cures. The moisture from adhesive left on the surface will be absorbed by the wood, causing swelling and slowing drying time. Hardened glue can also clog sandpaper, dull planer knives, and repel wood stains. 
Once the adhesive has dried, use a paint scraper to remove any squeeze out that remains.